So I want to start by thanking Carrie Sherrado for that amazing presentation. And thank you for all your work. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dante Paredes, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Department of Osteopathic Medicine at UNT HSC TCOM. He works at the HSC Health Central Family Medicine Clinic with a clinical focus on reversing diabetes, obesity, and generalized anxiety disorder. In addition, he teaches clinical nutrition in the TCOM Family Medicine Corps Clerkship. He is core faculty for the Medical City of Fort Worth Family Medicine and Osteopathic Neuromuscular Medicine Residencies. And you'll enjoy this, I promise. Welcome, Dr. Paredes. Hello. Testing. Just testing the audio? That sounds way louder than yesterday. Is there a way to just bring that down like half a notch? Cool, all right, cool. The other version was like echoing back into my own head from the ceiling. I'm like, that's, that's migraine turf. All right, so good morning. I was here last night talking about liver things. I ended talking about uh, the role of exercise, and that was kind of like the end point before pharmacology. Today we're gonna talk about the exercise game um, in isolation. So there's a lot of ways to train, okay? Today the mission is I want the people coming out of this lecture hall to be just a little more competent in specifically strength training. Um, just a little bit of background context. I've been a doctor for only a few years, but I've been a strength athlete and a trainer, uh, either in barbell, kettlebell work or martial arts for, Jesus, 13, 13? 13 years now. So like I have, what happened was, I want to bridge that part of my life into this one, particularly because that part of my life informs how I administer my lifestyle counseling, right? You can't teach people how to live better if you don't have a model of what that means. So in a way to deliver it sincerely, I like to give them my solutions as opposed to abstract solutions. So today, we focus on strength training in the primary care setting. Now, I know this isn't like um, just family care docs, right? We have other spells. How many primaries do we actually have here? Redacted. The majority of us here are primaries. So this is directly to y'all. Good for you. Okay, so let's talk objectives. We're going to uh, recognize the benefits of strength training for the prevention of chronic disease. We're going to familiarize ourselves with basic principles of uh, exercise programming, okay? Both in that language and two, in how to talk about it. Third is that we're going to actually uh, model and discuss, hence, this positioning. We're good on camera side, yeah? Rock on. We're going to actually demonstrate uh, several of these movements. Now, because there's a podium here, line of sight, yeah, you guys will be fine. I'll figure out what to do with y'all just to get positioning right. But we're gonna demonstrate everything I'm talking about today. The way I'd like to start this lecture is by introducing the idea of strength coaching separate from personal training per se. There's a separate discipline of highly trained individuals called strength coaches. You have to go to, you have to, go to a course for it, you certify for it, they get their clinical hours, their training hours basically. The quote that's in the bottom of this lecture, or of this slide, summarizes the philosophy of that field. Okay? It's a harsh quote, to be perfectly honest, but there's something to it. The first job today is gonna to be to take that quote and bridge it over into the clinical language that we speak so naturally. The quote is, strong people are harder to kill than weak people and more useful in general. It's a little provocative, right? But there's something to it. Again, this is, a, this is like an axiomatic presupposition of the strength game. So before we can talk about training like them, let's learn how they think. What does it mean to be harder to kill and more useful as a clinician? In the exercise language, we have several parameters. These parameters, in, con in conjunction, create a phenomenon we call general physical preparedness. That is a technical term we can measure and train. GPP, general physical preparedness, is your, it's your work capacity. It's your ability to do stuff and to recover and to do more stuff, more or less. 
we break it down into several sub-phenomenon. We have your cardiorespiratory endurance, right? How hard can you run for how long, right? What's your VO2 max? We talk about muscle endurance. How many reps can you bang out of a given movement before you begin to fail at the rep to fatigue? Your strength endurance, how much load can you handle for how much time? Same thing before fatigue takes over. I can handle 200 pounds on my back for X amount of meters, but I can handle at a lot more meters at 100, right? Versus if you put 300 pounds on my back, I can only last for so long. Those kinds of parameters. How flexible am I? How many DOs here do the manipulation game? Solid. This is your turf. Cool. Um, flexibility and mobility are kind of put into one term in this field. So I recognize that flexibility, your, bend, your stretchiness and your mobility, your movementiness are two different things. But in the sake, for the sake of this conversation, we're combining that into one term. We're calling it flexibility as such. We have your ideal body composition. Do I really care about your BMI? Maybe as a heart doc, maybe, because the load does matter. But honestly, for the most part, I care more about your body composition than your BMI. I'd much rather be 32 BMI with a body fat percentage of 18 than a, body fat, than a BMI of, let's say, 22 with a body fat percentage of 34. Does that make sense to everybody here? Excellent. And then your work capacity. Again, how hard can we run you so that you can recover and then do it again? Not just do it again, but do more the next time. Let's talk clinically, because I got a bunch of doctors here. If I take those phenomenon and try to speak in our terms, all right, how do, how do physicians speak? We don't talk about attribute progression, right? We don't train traits in our patients per se. We prevent problems, and that's okay. How do I turn that language into prevention? We're gonna talk about preventing metabolic syndrome. That was last night's talk. You guys know what that is by now, good. We're gonna talk about prevention of sarcopenia, AKA the lack of muscle. We're gonna talk about prevention of osteopenia, the lack of bone or well-structured bone, right? We're gonna talk about preventing deconditioning. It's a little more of a nuanced diagnosis. It's like your cardiorespiratory fitness is so low that just the act of living is stress on your body, right? And then we're gonna talk about the delay of frailty. How many folks here are geriatricians or work deeply with the geriatric population? Excellent. The reason I wanna bring up frailty as a diagnosis is a lot of my uh, more general FP folks don't work with frailties of proper diagnosis as much, right? Frailty is a very specific thing. That's not just your weak and deconditioned. It's your weak and deconditioned such that you're reserved to heal and to protect yourself from infection. It, like, that begins the death spiral, right? We're talking about prevention and delay of, delay of frailty. You don't have to die weak. Does that make sense? Excellent. Metabolic syndrome, I'm gonna cut to the chase. If you strength train as a monotherapy, that doesn't mean don't do your cardio. I'm saying as its own thing, you can reduce your A1C, you can reduce your blood pressure. That is well supported in the literature across the board. Why? We all know that if you eat food, you secrete insulin, the insulin takes the GLU4 receptors, puts it up in the cell membranes, and then you absorb sugar, good for you. I have a bunch of osteopaths in the room. You guys know about mechanotransduction. The more muscle you activate, Right, the act of activating muscle recruits those GLUT4 independent of insulin into the cell membrane. What does that mean? That means that the more muscle you work, the more glucose 4 receptor things you put into the cell membrane, the more sugar you're apt to absorb from the blood, as in you can drive sugar into the body without insulin using movement. How much movement? Compound movements. I'm not talking about, bar I'm not talking about bicep curls, I'm talking about deadlifts. Who here does not know what a deadlift is? Just checking, okay, cool. In the same way that intensity, if you look at the slide, intensity is gonna drive down the A1C because the more muscle you activate, the more sugar you absorb, your volume will bring down your blood pressure. And for those who are familiar with some of uh, the literature, uh, uh, Herman, Herman Ponzer, like energy metabolism guy, basically the energy we spend on exercise takes away from our energy we can spend on other things, right? You burn a thousand calories, I'm just making up numbers now, you burn a thousand calories doing your whatever training, that's a thousand less calories you have to spend on inflammation, sympathetic activation, reproductive things, and all that good stuff. And that's a good thing, because you don't want your inflammation system to have more energy than it needs. Because can you imagine what happens if you give a surplus to a system designed to fight? It looks for things to fight, do you understand me? So give it what it needs, not an ounce more, and it calms the hell down, and that's a good thing. As far as sarcopenia and osteopenia, the things I want to bring attention to, okay, so 
um, I'm going to admit something that I learned while I was preparing for this lecture, right, to my geriatric folks, because most of you guys raised your hands over here. Can I do that for the camera? Is that all right? Just making sure. When I was learning my exercise phys, when I was learning my just general human phys, and even medicine, I was trained to think that once you cross 40, it's basically done. The idea was once you cross 40, you can maintain what you got. You can remodel your muscle, you can remodel your bone, you can gain strength in fascia, but you will not put on meaningful lean body mass. But you can prevent the slowdown. Now, I will tell you right now, I am wrong in that. I learned that I was wrong, but I was trained to think that. You can still put on mass in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, even the 80s based on this literature, and not just put on mass like adipose. I'm talking about the good stuff, muscle and bone, strongly wired muscle and bone, but it takes loads like this. A 36-week high-intensity resistance training program was given to a bunch of 79 plus or minus two-year-old men, and over that interval, look at these gains. That's 1.25 kgs of lean body mass, of which a decent amount was quad. And keep in mind, they gained that mass while dropping down in adiposity, and that's a damn good thing. Because, yeah, you want to be kind of heavy in your geriatric years, but heavy does not mean fat. Heavy can mean built of the right stuff. What's the right stuff in this place? I'm talking about dry body mass. I'm talking about your muscle, your fascia, your bone. Frailty, specifically. That's the one I want to uh, dr uh, drive in. Frailty is typically understood as a spiral. You can do a lot to slow it down, but it's a bad place to be. It takes a lot of resources to get somebody stable when they're frail. You can delay that phenomenon if you have a sufficient strength reserve. I want you guys to have this idea in your head, okay? So there's a reason why I was taught that when you're 40 plus, you lose what you got. Who here is a mathematician before they were doctors? Just in case, sorry about that. There's a phenomenon in mathematics called the Red Queen's Gambit. That's like Alice in Wonderland stuff. The Red Queen's Gambit is this idea, who's, who's read Alice in Wonderland? Like the Lewis Carroll stuff. Awesome, in my kingdom, you run and run as fast as you can to stay in the same place. You remember that part? Red Queen trying to chop off Alice's head? It's that phenomenon in real life. The Red Queen Gambit is this idea that entropy is the default state. If you don't maintain momentum, you actually decline. The idea is, and I mean this mathematically, maintenance is not a thing. You're either progressing or you're receding, but the act of progressing in a, in a collapsing system is what's happening under the surface to make the superficial phenomenon of maintenance. It's a lot of fancy way of saying, if you're not growing, you're failing. And I mean that in a very formal sense. So how do you prevent that? How do you delay that? You gotta train. And as you get older, the training demands don't go down, they go up. Because the cool thing about being a kid is, hey, you're still growing. You're growing by default, man. You're good. Just do it in the right direction. Once you get to a certain age and the collapse becomes the default setting, you need to engineer the way to maintain. You need to think about it more, right? What took me half an hour of training when I was 17 takes me maybe an hour and a half now that I'm 32. Does that make sense? How much will that take when I'm older? God dang, that's a full-time job. But I'll be retired. What am I going to do other than keep my body up and hang with my grandkids anyway? Does that make sense? But the act of training lets me hang with those grandkids that don't exist yet. God forbid I'm too weak to be able to pick up a 25-pound old baby. That red bell, by the way, weighs 25 pounds. The thing that made me believe in this from a clinical perspective is the Berg Balance Score. Is anybody here familiar with the Berg Balance Score? It's something we use in PM&R more so. Okay. The Berg Balance Score is this menu of criteria we're seeing right here. For those on that side, right there. Okay. You take that index, you score it, you get an aggregate score. The lower your score, the harder it is for you to function independently. Slide next is going to be the criteria and the scores. If your score is 49 plus, you are basically independent, rock on. Regardless of whatever you got going on, you can still do your own thing. However, as the number goes down, you need progressively more and more assistance. Canes to frames to rollators to something to push you around so you're basically chair bound or bed bound. In the previous slide, I mentioned that frailty, right? graded by the BBS, strength training as an intervention, not even as a preventive, as an intervention, boosted that score on average by 17 point what? 17.4 points. Let's see what 17.4 points buys you in that scale. Let's take a guy who's at 18, right? 18 plus 17, who can do math real quick? It's morning time, I know. 30 something, good. 18 plus 17 puts you at 35, it's, guys, it's 35 and change. 35 puts you from requires physical assistance in all activities to function with a rollator. 
All right, you got your lady or dude with a rollator. Let's add 17 to that. 17 plus 33, because I just worked off that one, puts you at 40 plus 50, puts you at 50. Training, if you can figure out what it takes to get them trained, will take you from rollator to independent. How valuable is that? And keep in mind, these aren't like 60-year-old, relatively healthy folks. We're talking in this population for this study, it was 79, 75 plus or minus three-year-old geriatric women with no training history. And they were taught how to deadlift. That's one of the lifts today, by the way. Can y'all imagine a bunch of like UK folks deadlifting in that age group? It was amazing. The appendix for this has pictures, by the way. Not, not of my presentation, of the, of the paper. Guys, one more time, the green links that you guys have in your handouts in your PowerPoint presentations are links to the papers I refer to. All right, and when you put this all together, right, the lack of metabolic disease, the lack of frailty, the lack of uh, bone and muscle lacking and all that good stuff, the all-cause mortality goes down by 24%, by 26%. The hazard ratio of mortality in the 12-year uh, time window goes to 0.74. Heart disease by 0.75, as in drops by a quarter. Cancer death by 0.91, because y'all know, the reason I like fasting so much, intermittent fasting, is because it's simulated metabolic effects of exercise minus the muscle gain. And you know that the fasting game does some weird stuff to oncogenesis, so does training. Because it turns out when you train, you trash a bunch of stuff that isn't worthy and you have to rebuild with what you got. And cancer cells just don't do well with anoxic stress, man. And when you're, when you're holding these bells and trying to breathe right and you can't breathe, it's an anoxic stress and we like that in this context. That's only if you strength trained. If you did resist, if you did aerobic training on top of your strength game, look how big that magnitude gets. You cut it by half. We talked about what? I can cut cardiac mortality in half if I were to do the fix the liver game. Cut it by another half if you did the fix the liver game. And you were to what? Get them strong enough? What's half and half? It's a damn good reduction, right? Good. When you put that all together, this sentence should make more sense, right? To be strong is to be harder to kill due to chronic disease. To be more useful is to have that independence, to, to avoid that deconditioning and frailty, to function independently, to maintain your ADLs, to not need home health, to not need a loved one to become your caregiver and sack whatever he or she got to work as a dyad with you. Does that make sense? It's freedom. So let's talk about how to make this work. What prevents us from talking about this? Because that's a damn good game, right? Imagine if there was a pill that can do that shit. Oh, dang, I cursed. I am caffeinated today, by the way. <laughs> a really nice study tried to survey patients and physicians to figure out why we don't do this. Okay? The main reason docs don't do this is because we don't know how. That's not an insult. We're smart folks. We made it this far. But we're not trained to know this. For all the time we spend learning what we do, how many of y'all really spend time learning how to strength coach and how to train really? Unless that's your nerd thing, like it's mine, right? If I wasn't this guy for 10 years before becoming a doctor, why would I, like who would, who would hold me accountable for knowing this? But if you don't know, now you know. Other than knowledge, it was execution, okay? I know how to train, but I don't know how to train my guys or my girls. I know how to train, but how do I get paid for this? Does that make sense? Legitimate barriers. I want to resolve some of that right now. On the patient end, three things kept coming up. I don't know what to do in the gym, or I don't know what to do with weights to do this, right? Give me some like bicep curls. Am I doing right by you, sir? Maybe, hell if I know. The answer is no, by the way. Bicep curls, by the way, aren't useless. I'm crapping on them a lot today. It's because they're good for very specific things, but they're not good for all-purpose stuff like what we're talking about. It's inconvenient, because for Americans, think about how we model training. I need, to do, I need to get my X amount of minutes of cardio, I need to get my X amount of minutes of resistance training, I need to do the laundry, I need to pay the bills, I need to take the kids to daycare. We can rattle it off in line with chores. It's a chore for us to maintain healthy. And I'll be frank with you, that's just the wrong dang attitude to have about your body, right? It shouldn't be a chore to maintain this, right? Um, I take my performance and my body very seriously because I have work to do. So this, I take taking care of my body about as sincerely as I, take, as I take sincerely taking care of my gear, my car, my whatevers. Does that make sense? My ability to do my thing, whatever that thing is, is contingent upon my ability to maintain health. So why would I consider this a chore? This is my work. 
Or what if I want to aspire to something? Man, I want to be able to carry my wife and kids out of a burning building that's two stories big. That's an adventure waiting to happen, right? That's not about like, oh, I need to get my cardio in because I need to keep my heart from attacking. It's I need to be strong enough to do my duty, whatever my duty is. And the duty doesn't have to be heroic stuff. It can be being independent, whatever. I don't care. That's their goal. It's the patient's goal. But you give them the hardware to run their software and good for them, good for you. And then there's a shame component, because let's be real, um, we don't have the most positive viewpoints on our bodies, right? Oh man, I'm too fat. Oh man, I'm too weak. Oh man, uh, I want to train in that gym, but dude over there looks intimidating, and I don't want to look like a scrub trying to move these weights, right? These are legitimate barriers. You don't want to downplay that. How do you address all three? Let's talk about how to address all three, plus the doctor ones too. So let's break through it. Any questions so far? We're good? Excellent. We're going to introduce fundamental concepts and vocabulary. I want you guys to know these words. Take a picture of the dang thing, download it, whatever. But these are the words you want to know if you're going to talk to other exercise professionals with some degree of competence, because they'll understand these words, so so should you. Overload is what we're looking for. It's the idea that if you challenge the body more than what it can handle at current, then it will recover if you recover correctly to the point where it can do more. So if I can handle 10 pounds today and I train right, when I recover, I'll handle 12, 15, 20, so on and so forth. For the patients that you're concerned with, this is a linear progression, as long as you recover. There's a time point when that's no longer the case. Save that for the sport medicine docs. There's a point where it does change. But for the sake of clinical work, for what we're talking about, it is basically linear, assuming adequate nutrition and rest. That is a big deal here. The second phase is that progression fo uh, component. I can't train with the same weight the same way forever because the Red Queen's gonna get me. Now you know why I talk about the Red Queen, right? Lewis Carroll stuff, all right, cool. Math is cool. I like calculus, by the way. We have specificity and transference. This is why I keep bringing up bicep curls. I'm not gonna get better leg extensions. I'm not gonna improve my ADLs with a bicep curl. This is not how it is. But if I squat, what's a squat, right? You want to find the exercises that cross over to real life as cleanly as possible, because most of your patients aren't athletes, whether they could think that, I think they're athletes, they just don't know that yet. But because they don't consider themselves athletes, you want them to pick things that are minimally invasive, maximally beneficial. 80-20 stuff, right? So if I can train only two lifts, what can I do with two movements that'll get as much done as possible so they don't have to do a thousand one things on like a Nautilus machine, the, the machine things in the gym. Rest and recovery. This is a big one. I want to drive this point in. You don't get stronger training. I'll say it again, you do not get stronger in training. In fact, you get weaker transiently. You get strong in the recovery phase. So any good discussion of how to get strong requires you to calibrate how you recover. And that's the game you guys know well because we know how to run diabetes, we know how to run liver stuff as of last night, right, and so on and so forth. The better your metabolic health, the better your diet and exercise and your rest and your stress and your sleep and all that good stuff, right, the better your recovery, that means you get to work harder, smarter. Good. And then you have the nutrition and hydration game. I just want to let you know that they speak that language too. In fact, they probably speak it better than us. However, you should know just enough to talk to them. That was last night's talk. I'm going to ask my buddy, Dr. Bell, to come up here. Okay. Dr. Bell is one of my residents, and is a, he's a good friend and colleague. He's been a, uh, a strength athlete and trainer for quite some time, about as long, if not longer than I have. He's going to assist me today in demonstrating several of these movements while I talk. So, I want to start with this idea. In the strength game, I don't give a damn about your muscles. Your bicep, your psoas, your quads, your glutes, your whatever. I care about your movement pattern. That sucks, because it means we need to learn movement patterns. So how do we break up movement in a way that's productive? Thankfully, I'm talking to a bunch of DOs. So this is gonna be easy, right? There's a bunch of ways to break down movement. This is the most common set I've seen. This is also the language your PTs, your physical therapists will speak, so I'm gonna use this instead. This does not mean don't use other ones. It just means, hey, look, man, we can only learn so much. Let's start with these five. The big five, as proposed by, doc, by coach uh, Dan John, is the push, pull, hinge, squat, and the loaded carry. Now, Dr. Bell, I'm gonna ask him to display a decent pushing exercise, maybe a push-up or something to that effect, right? So if Dr. Bell can start banging out some push-ups, we don't have to think about this too hard. He's pushing himself off of the ground to push. That's the push off, to push on, so on and so forth. To pull, 
which is a little bit more technical because it's hard to do without any load if you want to grab any of those or just pull me for all I care. But the idea is you want to be able to rip something off of the surface of whatever it's at, whether you're pulling something down, pulling something up, pulling something sideways. This is called a row. Note how he pulls the object off the ground. You want humans able to pull things off the ground, like a running around little toddler. Can you pull crap off the ground without hurting yourself? We have the hinge. Now, I'm going to have him perform this in the sagittal plane relative to you guys. Any old hinge. Notice that the knee stays straight. He gets most of the movement from his hips. The back stays relatively neutral. Neutral does not mean straight, by the way. So that if he were to pick up a load, I'm going to always refer to kids, by the way, because that's the main load I have to pick up nowadays. That weighs about as much as my kid, by the way. He's four. He's 50, he's 50 pounds as of this morning. He can pick it up in a way that will not cause him harm, right? Or imagine he's picking up a pallet, moving, moving furniture. The next one is a squat. A squat requires more movement from the knees and the hips, okay? Everybody can get up right now? Seriously. Get your butts up. Okay? And then sit down. Congratulations, you squatted. But the thing is, a lot of, a lot of folks think about this this way. To sit down, they have to grab onto the chair rails and they like lower themselves down. Then they like stumble and fall into the chair and hope for the best. God, I hope the chair is over there, you know what I mean? But you want to be able to sit down in a controlled fashion. Who sat down without touching anything other than the chair with their butts? Good. You know a lot of your patients can't do that. Imagine trying to get up and you have to hand assist, right? The squat is your sit skill set or your pick other stuff up skill set. Sir, can you demonstrate an eight, like a deep squat, like to the bottom? This movement is basic for, us, for our species. Like This is how we need to defecate, first of all. This is also how we can rest actively. Westerners are terrible at squatting. That's categorical. It's not a genetic issue. It's because the environment we've created. Ha how many chairs are here? You know what I mean? Like if I want to hang with this dude and we just want to talk about stuff, I can sit with him and like this is comfortable, but we have to earn that. Because as Westerners, our default setting would be over a chair and a table. So how do we replace that? Because that's an issue for us. Some folks will say like the squat game, uh, the inability to squat, or rather the need to sit too much, is almost as bad, if not as bad, as smoking. And we all care about smoking, right? What if I told you the effect size for all-cause mortality for not being able to squat was about as big as tobacco? Now you'd go, oh crap, maybe tobacco isn't as bad then. <laughs> exactly. That's a joke for the people online. Yeah. The inability to squat, or rather sitting too much, seems to be as deleterious for the system as tobacco. And we all cringe at the word tobacco at this point, right? So this, the inability to do that should set off alarm triggers too. What I'm going to show you guys are movements. Huh? Skip load. Oh, skip load. Yeah, pick up some stuff. <laughs> the last one is a loaded carry. Grab some weight and go for a dang walk. I don't care how you hold it. But the ability to hold load and maintain this core tension, sir, keep that overhead press up. I'm just going to lightly tap on your belly. And to maintain the abdominal integrity, to be able to hold something and not drop it is a big deal because how many of y'all are parents? How many of y'all have to hold your kid in that exact position and go for a walk and your kid's flailing and kicking, slaps you in the, in the testicles, you know what I mean? Grabs your hair. Can you maintain your abdominal integrity while your kid is going full MMA on you? It's hard, man. My kid weighs 50 pounds and he's a monster. Because he trains. <laughs> the red bell, by the way, is my kids. He's, 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 he's good. These are the five basic movements I want to um, kind of focus on today. The exercises I want to display okay, are the best bang for buck exercises that I can think of. That does not mean that they're the only ones. This is not a fully balanced program. This is designed to hit as many problems as possible in as minimal time, so you can give your patients a one or two, move on and do other things like you know, uh, talk about the liver or something. So these were all selected because they hit every muscle from toe to tongue. It's hard to explain what I mean from toe to tongue until you administer some load on the body, but I mean this sincerely. Everybody, when he does these movements, watch his veins. For real, eyes on his veins as he moves, okay? You'll see what I mean with this toe to tongue component. He can't really work out your eyelids with this, I'm sorry. They are all able to progress without changing the movement itself. As in, when you get strong enough in these movements, you can get stronger by adding more load or doing it for longer. You don't have to learn a whole new thing. My issue with bodyweight exercises is it is hard to get strong doing just bodyweight 
unless you're willing to learn how to progress the body weight skill set. You get some push-ups, good, and now you can do push-ups, what's next? You can't do more push-ups because you already got that adaptation. Maybe do it one arm, maybe do it a handstand, maybe do it off of a thing. It gets harder, and that takes skill. So unless you're willing to go full Cirque du Soleil, the calisthenics has a limiting factor unless you're willing to invest a skill. That being said, if you invest a skill, rock on. They are relatively easy to teach whether because they're simple or because the resources are out there to be taught effectively. And then the last one is safety. These are all movements that I can trust my orthopedic patients to run. I can trust my cardiac patients to run. I can trust my untrained guy to watch a couple YouTube videos, do it in front of me in the clinic and me sign off on it and they can do it, right? So let's talk about them. It's the sumo deadlift, the Turkish get up and the hard style kettlebell swing. I'm gonna show you a picture of these movements and then Dr. Bell is going to display them for and or with me depending on how much time we have. The first thing is a barbell deadlift. It is a combination of a pull and a hinge. I'm gonna have another slide for you to start displaying it. But just get that visual real quick. It is a pull and a hinge. You pick a big object off the ground, in this context a barbell. You have the Turkish getup, that's me without a beard, in which you literally practice getting off the ground with load over your face. You can see why that's an important skill set. This is the main thing I give to my geriatric patients, by the way. In my OMM clinic, I'll do some manipulation, and I'm like, look, man, you're deconditioned and frail, formally speaking, formally speaking. If you run this drill, even in parts, you will improve in that parameter as long as you rest and recover. I'll, I'll straighten out your pelvis, whatever. Let me introduce you to my kettlebell. And then the hard style kettlebell swing, um, in which you basically take the weight, project out between your legs like a football, bring it up to the front, back and forth, and cycle it. The reason I like the kettlebell uh, swing is because not only is it a, is a, a push, pull, and a hinge, but it's also your cardio, which means, hey, by the way, you can get your cardio training all in one, which means, hey, guess what? You cut that risk by how much now? Let's make the case for the deadlift. Dr. Bell, would you mind grabbing whichever weights you want? and start performing just some easy deadlifts so they can see what this is about. Oh yeah, okay. it's your show. And everybody observe what he's doing. The weight is down, he picks it up, it's about as simple as that. Who's seen that, uh, that Planet Fitness commercial, right? I pick things up and put things down, meet the lift. The important thing to note is, this is my single best intervention for low back pain of the lower cross variety that Dr. Hansen described in yesterday's didactic. The majority of occupational back pain isn't technically because of um, anything fundamental to their anatomy, it's because of a lack of technique and a lack of strength to do the job. For example, there's a good literature showing that um, if you can sumo deadlift 2.5 to 3 times body weight, that will dramatic reduce your, dramatically reduce your injury risk at the job if you're a first responder or a combatant athlete. That's my military guys, my law enforcement, my firefighters, my EMS, my paramedics. Doc, my back hurts. Yeah, it's because you're weak. No, nah, man, I can lift patients. I'm like, yeah, good for you. Move your butt. Yeah, your butt's weak. They're taking that load onto something they can't handle it, therefore they get hurt. If you can handle 2.5 to 3 times body weight, you have enough strength in reserve to handle not just you, but that patient you're moving or that target you're assessing. Does that make sense? 2.5 to 3 times body weight's a lot, right? You weigh 150 pounds. Double that is what, 300? So it goes, Doc, I weigh too much for that, man. I can't pull 800 pounds. I'm like, hey, you need to lose some weight. So now there's a calibration component. You need to be light enough that that 2.5 to 3 is even feasible, and you train to get that feasibility. We'll run those deadlifts in my office, and I'll run that as a mono intervention. Like, I'll go, I'll meet them, I won't even touch them, and say, hey, start training this lift, call me in six weeks, we'll reassess you there, tell me if there's still problems. If so, maybe we'll do some manipulation. And you'd be shocked at how many of my Marines come back saying, Doc, my pain's gone. I'm like, yeah, no shit. That's two times I said it. It's the caffeine. The next one's the Turkish getup. Now this one we're gonna run slow. Everybody eyes on bell real quick. Pick whichever weight you feel comfortable with. Now I'm gonna actually dictate through this one. So observe. Dr. Bell's gonna lie down, he's gonna take the red kettlebell and bring it to center line. Two hand assist to make sure he doesn't tweak his elbows. You guys might wanna to come to this side for it, just for the sake of a uh, visual. He's gonna press the bell in front of him, kinda of like the way you would push a pistol. Similar grip, not exactly the same, but close enough. He's stabilizing his core all throughout, and what he's gonna do, he's going to roll himself lateral recumbent. He's using his left arm as a splint and he's going to use his elbow and his left palm to drive himself into the seated position. At this point, he should be relatively comfortable. He's still holding his breath, so let me get him to the next position so we can get a cycle in. He's gonna pop his hips up, 
half bridge, plant here and square off his hips into what looks like the bottom of a lunge position. At this point, he, if he wanted to, he can cycle a breath. But that entire movement from where he was down there to here, he tends to have to hold his breath to retain abdominal tension to move the weight accordingly. From here, he's going to stand up. Okay, Good integrity there, same thing, just lightly wrapping against his belly. All of this is solid. He's going to bring himself back down in reverse. The leg comes down. He's now doing a lunge. He's going to search for the floor with his left leg, with his left arm. He founds the floor. He's going to sit his butt down, straighten off his hips, go back lateral recumbent, and he's going to lie down flat on his back, and he's going to disengage from the weight in a controlled fashion, whatever way he wants. That's half. Afterwards, you don't have to do this part, he'll clear the weight to the other side and do the same thing on the other side. That's one rep. That's loaded yoga. There's a couple really interesting features here that I like to dissect for my patients. For example, that's the full kit. Like what he did was the full movement. And for a lot of my patients, I'd like them to do the full movement. When I want to introduce this to my patients, we'll use this as a way to kill time while talking. Sir, please remove your shoes. We talk about these movements being safe, and you just saw how much time that weight spent over his face. Who saw that and thought, oh yeah, this looks totally safe? Because hmm. if you did, stop. There's, there's risk factors here. The way I make this safe is my patients train this on their shoe. The reason why is because if the shoe falls on them, their technique is poor, keep training it like it's yoga until you can load weight, and two, if a shoe falls on your face, that's a little demoralizing, but it's not going to kill you. He's now going to practice the lift with his shoe. Oh, that's too easy for you, man. Do it over a fist. Do it over your fist, man. Too, too skilled, too skilled. So watch how he has to pay attention to every movement. See that, that shoe wobble? He has to not panic and maintain all the right angles because there's no grip here. If his arm, osteopaths here, you know that, that plumb line, right? Postural line. If his arm drifts off plumb line in any vector, that shoe's going to drop. So this forces you to be perfect. And I'll tell you right now, I demand perfect for my patients when they do this movement because of the safety component. And because I'm so strict about how they run that movement before they can touch that weight, now it becomes a safe movement. Some of my patients want a bit more of a kung fu vibe. So I give them a, bottle, I give them a bowl of water instead. That's actually how I was trained. So like when I was introduced to this movement when I was 19, they gave me a shoe. And coming as a martial artist, I'm like, it's a shoe, man. I got this. I did it. And he's like, all right, show off. Do it this way instead. He gave me a bowl of water. And within about 10 seconds, I was wet. And I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> but he forced me to get that good. Uh, his name is Chris Vroom. He's a nurse now. Really smart dude. But because he, also his last name is Vroom. It just works for, for an athlete. But um, I had to get so many reps at that bowl in my home before I was uh, kind of like comfortable to add weight that by the time I'm adding load, it was a struggle but the form was still perfect. I'm going to have him do one more, um, 55 pounds or 70 pounds, whichever you prefer. I know I want you to pick a weight that you have to focus now, because this weight is presentation weight. Sure. Pick a weight that will force some challenge. Yeah, I'll you. Excellent, sir. So I want you guys to watch two things. Watch what his arms do. Watch what his neck does as he goes through these motions. Okay. Again, I know he's competent for perfect form. So now it's just training. Everybody observe Bell. His name's Bell, by the way. I had to make that joke once, man. All right, he's going to go through the motions. He's going to load the weight onto center line and do this at your pace. I'm actually going to shut up so we can focus. Eyes on Bell. Excellent, sir. Looking good. For those who are close enough to see, pay attention to his neck veins and look at the way he has to slow down and control his arm movements. The load is the corrective. The load forces you to move right or fail. Failing in this context does not have to hurt you. Thank you, sir. Hey, that was... Clap for the dude, man. Shit. <laughs> yeah. That was a challenge weight for you, correct, sir? Yeah. Perfect. I don't think it's perfect on that one. There you go. Oh, man, you ran the 70. Yeah. That's 70 pounds. I apologize. I thought he grabbed the 55 pound. He did a PR. He did a, he did a personal best on that one. You have a question, sir? We'll get there. How many reps in sets? He asked how many reps in sets. We'll get there next.
Good, good, good. There's actually one more movement to discuss. This is the most technical of the sets. So I wanted to give time to this one. Next movement is going to be the kettlebell swing. Recover your air and just start banging out some easy swings with whichever weight you feel comfortable with. This movement is similar to the deadlift in its benefit. However, it adds a cardiopulmonary load. It also adds an agility load. Because when you run this, actually, good, park it. And I want you to face me. Excellent. I'm going to get away from this position. God forbid his grip fails. I want you to observe what happens to his heels. Eyes on his heels. And he'll bang out a set. Good. Because the weight is pulling him forward and back, he needs to cycle his balance forward and back. This is a moving Romberg test. If you want your patients to pass a Romberg, give them a cheat sheet. Run this lift, your balance gets real good or you fall. So do this maybe in front of like a chair or a pillow or something. But the act of teaching you how to do that how much abdominal tension do you need to retain and cycle to relax and tighten and relax and tighten to move the weight just right to not hurt yourself? Because there's a couple wrong ways to do this. We're not gonna display the wrong ways. You know what I mean? But if you move it wrong, one, it feels bad. Two, the weight doesn't look as good. Does that make sense? You wanna look slick doing this. Did he look slick doing this? I thought he looks pretty slick. That's not a compliment, by the way. That's a requirement. You can clap for him. The kettlebell swing is my preferred cardiovascular training for people with knee issues. I deal with a lot of first responders. My military, my law enforcement guys have so much mileage on their knees because of their line of, uh, line of work that I can't in good faith tell them to run more for their cardio when they lack their cardio. So I like this exercise a lot because it forces that cardiopulmonary strain in a way that's very kind to his knees. He's going to bang out a few more. Just go for five. And everybody eyes on his knees. Tell me how much his knees move. Look at that range of motion, man. There's basically nothing there. Just a little flexion to soften up the hips. Can you imagine your OA in the knee guy having that range of motion? I hope so, right? The hips, we can talk. It demands a lot from the hips, but the knees, that's kind, that's gentle. My OA patients run this for their conditioning routinely, especially my Navy guys, because man, Navy guys and knees are just bad. Sir. Correct. Uh, he asked if the heels were down with minimal movement for the knees. The answer is yes. You want the knees to move just enough to allow for an appropriate hip hinge. You're not trying to squat it down. There are some folks who will like do this weird thing with the weight and that's not what I'm asking for. That would be a, a large knee strain. You want very, very narrow movement on the knees and the majority to be in the hip line. So let's put that together. Thank you, sir. That was beautiful. Yes, sir. Uh, you can hang out, you can sit down, whatever you want to do. I'm going to go into the technical side. Does anybody else want to see him do anything else? <laughs> He's good. Good, good, good. Let's talk about how to program this. Now, when I say program, that should set off some alarms because you're like, what the hell does it mean to program? Programming is that language's way of saying prescribe. So when I say, I want to prescribe exercise to you, sir, the other part of me is saying, I'm going to program, uh, I'm going to create an exercise program for you, sir. They're equivalent statements. The American College of Sports Medicine created an acronym, it's FITVP, that's Frequency, Intensity, Timing, Type, Volume, and Progression. That's the minimum requirement to prescribe exercise of any movement competently. Like, who here has said, hey, you got the high blood pressure, I'm giving you a pill, and ended the script there? That's about how silly it sounds when you say, hey, I need you to train, and you leave them hanging. So you don't just say, hey, you should consider exercising more, sir. Deuces, where's my copay? You know what I mean? That's, that's just not the way to play it. You gotta give them some direction. So in the same way, I need you to take metoprolol, 12.5, blah, 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 blah. This is how we talk in those terms. So, an example is on Mondays and Fridays, the athlete, because everybody's an athlete when they're with me, even if they don't wanna be, will perform five sets of five reps of a sumo deadlift starting at 50% of a one rep max, with five minutes of rest between sets, each week the trainee will add 10 pounds to the starting weight and perform the same five by five plan until the trainee can no longer sustain that rate of growth or it's been about 12 weeks, after which point get back here and we'll reassess you. Does that sound pretty complete? Does that leave any room for ambiguity? Good. We're gonna make some examples. Now these are actual programs I give my patients, so everything from here on is real. No modeling, no nothing. This is what I'll actually load out to my patients for various reasons. So, for what it's worth, if you take these handouts, congratulations, you have at least my programs. This is a minimalist program for the general population. This is 
what I try to negotiate for my patients as the first move, and if they can't do this, I'll work around it. But this is my first offer, and if I can get them on this, rock on. What I like them to do is they warm up for five minutes using a jump rope or calisthenics or any mobility drills. There's a movement called a goblet squat, which I love to prescribe rigorously, where basically, eyes on me real quick, what you do is you squat down low. Okay, knees at the uh, knees and elbows lined up more or less. Back is straight, upright. You know what I mean. Some folks don't have the trapezius strength or anterior tibialis balance to run this. So what they can do is they can grab a weight and use it as a counterweight, so they can like use this to correct their positioning. And as they get stronger, they actually use less weight because now they don't need the counterweight to hold them in position. Or they do push-ups or they jump rope for five minutes. After the warm-up, which is no longer than five minutes, they'll do the main work and they get a choice. They can either do a five by five sumo deadlift or 10 times 10, 100, of those kettlebell swings that Dr. Bell showed you guys. Pick one, I don't care which one. In fact, alternate them every other session for all I care. But you get your choice. You can run pure deadlift, pure bell, run a ratio of the two, whatever, take your pick, it's yours. And then, after that's said and done, rest for a few minutes, and then you're gonna do an accessory exercise. You use enough strain doing the main lift that I want you to do something relatively easy. This is the time for you to practice your get up with a light load. My good guy over here asked how many reps, I'm gonna say 10 reps. 10 reps, five on each side of the weight that forces you to focus, not to burn you out. The get up is a lift that I don't like to perform to exertion, I perform it to, to perfection. Whatever weight you can perform perfectly is your training weight, right? You don't go for burnout. That's a rep, that's an exercise you don't go to failure on, ever. Does that make sense? I've done that once, I broke my hand. I was like 22, I think. I can remember my injuries, because they, they're my injuries. Now some folks, COVID era, right? Have the benefit of having their weights at home. So if you have a home gym, even if it's just a barbell, you know what, forget about the reps and sets, okay? Load up your barbell with a weight that makes sense to you, a weight that you can lift maybe, maybe eight times, but you're only gonna do three to five reps. Why so little? Because you're gonna do that, bang out your set, go back to your office, that's your living room. After an hour, go back and do it again. And now you accumulate your reps throughout the entire day. The recovery is so long that you can train throughout the day and still have energy in the bank for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? It's a very low intensity way to train, and it's a privilege for those who have gear at home. The cool thing is, by the way, COVID era for a lot of folks, we're all working from home anyway, so this becomes viable for those who it wasn't viable for if they make a minimum payment of buying a barbell or a kettlebell or whatever they get. We talk about shame, right? Not everybody has the confidence to go outside to train or to hire a trainer, so if they really feel that way, okay, fine, no one's gonna judge you. Buy some equipment. Train at home then. I'll tell you exactly what to do. And nobody has to see you. Hell, do it with the lights off for all I care. Unless it's a get up. Please don't do get ups with the lights off. Unless you're like stunting. You know what I mean? And repeat every hour throughout the day. Do this every other day. And now you get your strength training diet built into your lifestyle in a way that's natural. Let's say, this is Dr. Bell by the way. Let's say you don't have access to iron. Farm boy stuff. Grab a duffel bag, thickest one you got, okay? Loaded with rocks and bricks. Tie it. Pick it up. That's going to be a squat or a, or a deadlift, guaranteed, just because you have to pick up the thing and walk away. Walk away as far as you can, knowing that you have to turn around and walk back. Whatever that load is, whatever that distance is, that's your intensity. And as you get stronger and more fit, maybe you'll go farther. Maybe you'll add more rocks. How much does it cost for a burlap sack at like Michael's or something like that? Cool, how much do rocks cost? You understand me? This is my like, you have no money plan. As long as the outside environment is safe enough for you to be outside for, that's not a guarantee for everybody, right? As long as the outside environment is safe enough, this works. Do this twice a week, because this is pretty intense. Don't do this every day. There's a story of Milo. Who knows this picture? Who knows this story? Greek hero stuff. Basically, dude picked up a calf, loaded it on his back, went to market, tried to sell it, couldn't sell it, came back. And every dang day, man, he just tried to load up the calf, sell it to market over and over and over again. The calf kept getting big, and guess what? So did he. This is about as minimalist as I can make it. This is you have no money, you have no gear, and your environment is so hood that you can't go outside. This is you're stuck at home, or the pandemic or something. This is you're stuck in your living room. 
program. This is harder, and the reason I put this here is because this is harder, right? You can train without weights, but now you have to invest in skill. What you're gonna do is you're going to bang out 10 minutes worth of push-ups. Doesn't mean you're gonna bang out as many reps as possible. You bang out as many perfect reps at comfort with your push-ups. So if you only bang out five push-ups over 10 minutes, guess what, you did five push-ups, congratulations. Maybe next week you'll do six, and seven, and eight, and 10, whatever. But one day, one day, those push-ups will get easy. So now you have to make it harder. Elevate the legs, change the technique, right? Maybe make it one-armed, maybe one arm, one leg, right? How strong can you get doing push-ups? At some point you max out, you will max out. So you increase the leverage, you decrease the leverage, because for my DOs, you know leverage and fulcrums and stuff, right? You make the leverage to fulcrum thing much shorter to make the work that much harder, and then eventually you're doing handstand push-ups. Not saying everybody has to do handstand push-ups, but if you want to go pure body weight, that's what it takes. You start with the regular push-ups, maybe you go into diamond push-ups with a tighter arm, you go into one-arm push-ups, right? And then maybe you add some height, maybe one arm, one leg, but you can do it. Just know that it takes skill. So as long as you're willing to invest skill, which is free, then you can afford to run without load, which costs money. Similarly with a squat, everybody's gonna start by doing a squat, but one day this gets really easy. Right? Like, can anybody see any strain in me as I do this? This takes nothing. So, if I want to train body weight with a squat, I need to do something else. Maybe I'll try to squat with one leg. Because that takes that entire load and shares it with one part of me, so that effectively doubles the load. Does that make sense? That gets easy. Maybe I'll squat down on that one leg and hold it for time. That gets really easy. Did I mention I'm a parent? Meet my external loads. Son, get over here. Daddy, what do you want me to do? Roll up into a ball. Hang on, kid, we're going for a ride. You know what I mean? My kids think it's like a, like a carnival trick. So if I say, hey kiddo, grab on. My kid knows to tuck like this, and I can use him as a kettlebell. And he loves it, like it's a show for him. Like it's like, Dad, yay, you know what I mean? He loads up like this. I pick him up, load him like a cat, like, for my Turkish get-ups. He'll like do a little like dance up top. Like he'll open his body up and like plank off of my palm, fold himself up, put him back down. We put it on YouTube or whatever. It's great. Or I'll grab my younger children, my twins. Love you. You know what I mean? While they're slapping me and pulling my hair that I don't have. You know what I mean? If you're a parent, you can do this. And I say that story to my parents because I'm like, I don't have time, I don't have money, and I'm stuck in this apartment but you have kids, yeah? So, watch this. <laughs> Does that make sense? Lovely. From a minimalist perspective, because that's really what I'm talking about, I tend to say if you can invest in a set of kettlebells, a jump rope, and some skill, you can do most of what you need to do as general population. If you're a first responder, if you're a combat athlete, I'm not gonna play that game, I say figure it out. But for gen pop, that's good enough. And good enough is pretty damn good with my standards. 2.5 body weight? Who can deadlift 2.5 body weight out the gate, you know what I mean? You'll get that strong doing just this. What I did for you guys was I put video references in the PowerPoint. That's the edit I made with, uh, with Jill. If you guys want to see these movements broken down and taught, detail by detail, you can administer this to your patients. These links give you YouTube videos with really good instruction. I trust these videos to teach my patients when I can't or to take home as their discharge instructions. For those who like to read, these are the manuals that I consult uh, for my patients as well. To learn how to do swings and get-ups, simple and sinister, the patients will use the simple standard. My combat athletes and first responders use the sinister standard if you use that book. Get the second edition. The second book is One Arm Push-Ups and Squats. It's called Naked Warrior because they have no gear, so they're naked, right? If you want to learn how to build strength with barbells, starting strength and practical programming are probably my favorite places to start. Caveat being, you're gonna move on from them once you know how to lift. And then for the current understanding of strength physio from a clinical and from a scientific perspective, the best single book I've read was Super Training, sixth edition, by Dr. Mel Sif and Yuri Verhoshansky. Most of our strength game we learned uh, foreign side, because the American game is pretty good on cardiovascular. We have to learn most of our strength game from a different demographic, Eastern Bloc stuff, just because of the differences in culture. But that is the manual that informs how we even do this in the American context nowadays. 
So if you want like the, the equivalent of Robbins, who's the red Robbins? Dang right. This is Robbins for that field. Does that make sense? Lovely. The last two slides are pictures of people really doing this. There's Dr. Bell again. There's my wife. There's one of my other buddies, Dr. Rand Michael. He's a guy over in Virginia and myself. Notice how we administered external load for hiking. Osprey bags, they're a thing. Strap a kid onto your back, go for a walk. And then here's a couple more of my colleagues. Dr. Dave Mason, who you saw emceeing yesterday, he saw what we were doing when I was collecting these pictures and nobody would show him up, so he grabs his adult-ass kids and loads them onto his back and goes, look at me too, and I'm like, come on, man, what are you doing? But he can do it. He can do it. So on and so forth. Very good. The thesis of this being go train and train your patients. Questions? What about patients with, that have rotator cuff problems or, or post-surgical for rotator cuff repair? Of course. Sorry, it's not. The, um, the underlying assumption of this lecture was that we're talking about general physical preparedness. If you are recovering from an injury, if you're post-op, that's comfortably PT's turf. So that's when training the bicep, the, the, the supraspinatus, the et cetera, that's when that makes sense. What happens is you repair the part through PT, and then you return to activity through this. So in that scenario, I'd say finish your physical therapy or your muscle-specific rehab, and you discharge the strength, and then you get back to functional capacity on this side. Does that make sense? Excellent. I do make my rotator cuff injury patients do get-ups eventually, but that's like their graduation day present. You know what I mean? Like, hey, you're good. Meet the get-up. Sir? Can you speak a little bit more about the 72-hour rest period, yes, recovery sir. period? Absolutely. If you're going to train strength, okay, I mentioned it earlier, you're going to be weaker transiently before you recover. I want to give ample time, especially if you're going to deadlift routinely, it's a very high load on the body. So I want to give a couple days to recover in that movement. So typically it's 72 hours before you do the same exact thing. You can train other systems, you can even train the same movement different ways, but you don't train that exact same lift that same exact way for at least three. Is it is like best practices type of stuff. So like maybe I'll do, um, I'll do my sumo deadlift heavy on a, me for real, I'll do my sumo deadlift heavy on a Sunday, Monday I'll do my, my swings, which are similar in hinging but different intensity, and I'll do my goblet squat somewhere in between as recovery, and then I'll get back to my sumo deadlift by Wednesday or Thursday, pending my recovery rate. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. So that's 72 hours for the same movement and same intensity, not for movement in general. What else? Lovely. Uh, sir, thoughts? Uh, sorry. No, when it comes to the, the get up, how do you break it down to your patients who are struggling? Ah. Like, you know, like you said, each step, maybe they can't do the whole thing. How do you have them break it down? So it depends on if they can't get up or can't get down. I'll start from whichever one that is and, do, and work it step by step. So like, if the patient can't get down, they'll start here and they'll start at the lunge phase and work their way backwards. If they don't have the core integrity to get up, They'll start in the down position, and they'll typically work up to the seated, to here, and then get back down again. Does that make sense? Yeah, and they just have a chair or something by them so they can help themselves get up. Either a chair or a spotter, yeah. typically. Cool. But again, for those who can't get up, they'll work this, and they'll have assists, whatever that means. And if they can't get down, they'll start with the lunge. What else? I, I have a question. Um, yes, do you have any insight or thoughts on push-ups and if there are patients who can't do a full push-up using the wall versus knees? I've heard different thought processes on those. Knee push-ups are excellent. I use them all the time for my patients. And honestly, even for myself, if I need to work on a very specific leverage point. The hard thing about knee push-ups is that there's a tendency to hinge at the hips and stick the butt out. So as long as I can ensure correct spinal integrity and form, I really like knee push-ups. Um, typically, if they're that deficient that they need to use the knee push-up form, I make sure that the bracing game is good. So they'll do a lot of breathing drills, like uh, pranayama piston breath, kind of like what Matt Barker said yesterday, to make sure they have that integrity. And then I'll train them from a plank first, and then progress the knees, and then progress the length. And with this group, did you, I wasn't in the room, did you show the proper uh, formation as far as where you should have your hands to ensure that you don't have shoulder injury on a push-up? 
We didn't for push-up. We focused on the get-up, deadlift, and the two-arm uh, swing. But I can display the push-up probably better up close as opposed to podium just because of the, the angulation. So if you want to see it, I can do it after this happily. Cool. Um, I wasn't sure if you were telling me to stop or if you were trying to ask a question. I'm sorry. Perfect. Okay, cool. Cool. The guy asked if um, there's a flexibility program I'd like to endorse. If they're book reading types, there's a really nice book, Flexible Steel by uh, Coach John Engum, which for my readers, I'll use that. If they're not readers, I'll start with goblet squats, 90-90 uh, QL stretches, and hip opening drills, uh, typically like that goblet squat that I showed you before, or variations of uh, learning how to do like a pigeon pose in yoga. That'll be my opening moves in that context. I gotta give this to the next person, so anything else? I'll be outside for a while, okay? Thank you.